So we continue with our lesson on the concepts and applications of statistical inference. And right in our previous lecture, we were able to look at the various parts of the central limit theorem. And we went right into R to practice it and review what this theorem is all about. And we got to realize that the distribution of sample statistics, which happens to be the sampling distribution, is nearly normal, centered at the population mean with a standard deviation equal to the population standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. So we were able to look at various distributions of data and assume that to be a population. So we have a population of a normal distribution. We had that of the uniform distribution. We had an exponential distribution which yielded a, a right skewed distribution. And we also had the beta distribution that yielded a left skewed distribution. And we got to realize that from the various sample distributions that we get from any of these distributions, by calculating the sampling distribution, which happens to be the sample means, the distribution of the sample means, of course, was nearly normally distributed. And then we noticed that the mean of the sampling distribution was approximately equal to the population. And then the standard error, that is the standard deviation of the sample means, was actually the population standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. And that is what we were able to prove in our previous lecture. And so we would continue with the lesson by looking at one of the very important concepts in statistics known as confidence interval. So whenever you resort to taking samples from a population, different samples give rise to different values of the mean, right? And so the standard error, which happens to be the standard deviation of the sampling distribution, would give us an idea of how the sample means differ. To assess the accuracy of the sample mean as an estimate of the population mean, we calculate some boundaries within which we believe that the true value of the mean will fall. Those boundaries are known as the confidence intervals. So when we talk about confidence intervals, we are just simply referring to a defined range of values such that there is a specified probability that the value of a parameter or an estimate lies within it. So the usual confidence intervals we work with are the 90% confidence interval, 95% and 99% confidence interval. These are the common ones. You can have a 60% confidence interval. You can have a 98% confidence interval, but researchers usually work within the confines of these three confidence intervals. But the most common of all these confidence intervals is the 95% confidence interval. So if we are working with a 95% confidence interval, then after we have calculated a sample mean, which actually happens to be a representation or generalization of the population mean, we would like to calculate the confidence interval that we believe this sample mean falls within that range of values. And so if we are using a z-score, we actually follows some kind of the standard normal distribution um, where we tend to follow the central limit theorem and adopt the general rule of thumb that if our sample size is equal to 30 or more, then the distribution of the sample means would be nearly normally distributed. And so we use the z-score as the margin of error. And so what we do is we just take the sample mean and then we subtract the margin of error. And then we take the sample mean and we add the margin of error. So we'll be able to generate some level of confidence values for which the sample mean actually lies in between. But if your sample size is relatively very small, that is less than 30, then you would have a lower probability of getting a, a normal distribution. And so if you are conducting any tests, such as even involving calculating confidence intervals, you would then have to use what we call the student T distribution, right? And so we use what we call the T score. And you can use that to also calculate the confidence interval where the lower boundary would be the sample mean minus the margin of error. And that margin of error is simply the T statistic times the standard error 
that you made in your prediction of the sample mean. If you also want to calculate the upper boundary, then you will add the margin of error, which is the T statistic multiplied by the standard error. You will add it to the sample mean to generate the range of values, lower boundary, upper boundary, that we believe that the sample mean actually falls within that range. And some of these things are actually computed in R, so we will not be practicing these by hand. Now, there is also this concept called hypothesis testing. So sometimes whenever we calculate our sample statistic, we would like to test the hypothesis of whether this sample statistic is significant or not. And so for that matter, we have two forms of hypothesis testing. We have the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. Well, usually the null hypothesis is represented with the notation H and a subscript of zero, normally called H naught. And then the alternative hypothesis is H with a subscript of one or A. And so what really happens is with these null and alternative hypothesis, we formulate the null. Now, the null hypothesis, because it is coming from the word now, okay, once there is the now, it means that whatever you are doing equals zero. Now means zero, nothing, no effect, no treatment, right? Not significant. So then the null hypothesis always takes that sort of um, negative uh, uh, descriptions of the hypothesis you are testing. So if you are testing for statistical significance, then the parameter equals zero means that that parameter is not significant. Right, then the alternative hypothesis would be that it is not equal to zero. So that is something. If it is not equal to zero, whether it is positive or negative, that is something. And we are interpreting that value to be significant. Once we have been exposed to this concept of hypothesis testing, the whole thing is we would have to use the concept of p value to determine significance. And so the p-value is simply short for probability value of an estimate. And of course, this is computed in R whenever we perform some of these statistical analysis or tests. So in order to generate a decision rule as to whether our sample statistic or the population parameter is significant or not, we would have to compare the p-value with the significance level to make a decision on that statistical significance. So we compare the p-value with significance level. So we'll talk about what significance level really means in just a short while. So after you have compared, you would have to make a decision. So we call that the decision rule. And the decision rule is you would have to reject or do not reject. Sometimes do not reject can also be um, expressed as fail to reject. So these are the two terms that we use. We never say accept a hypothesis. We rather say we reject a hypothesis or we do not reject a hypothesis. But there are, there are two forms of the hypothesis, the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. So which one do we have to base our decision rule on? It is possibly the null hypothesis. So the null hypothesis states that our parameter is not significant, equal to zero, not significant. So if we reject this null hypothesis, then we accept the fact that the parameter is significant and that goes in favor of the alternative hypothesis. If the null hypothesis states that whatever parameter or sample statistic that we've calculated is not significant, failing to reject that null hypothesis would conclude that that parameter or sample statistic is indeed not significant. So what is significance level? It measures the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when it is true. And it's actually the complement of confidence level. So you can see how probability of rejecting the null hypothesis has been colored. That is, those, those are the key words in there. So it only measures this, the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis. So if you have a 90% confidence level, if as a researcher, you have a 90% confidence level, which is 0 0.9, then the significance level is 10%. That is the remaining percentage out of the 100 uh, total percentage. So 0 0.1. If you as a researcher 
are working with a 95% confidence level, 0.95, then your significance level would be 5%, the remaining 5%, 0.05. If you are working with a 99% confidence level, then your significance level would be 1%, which is 0.01. So recall that in our previous slide, we said we compare the p-value with the significance level to make a decision on significance. So now you know where the significance levels are coming from. So in order to make that decision, we'll have to compare the p-value with any of these significance levels. So if you are working with a 95% confidence level, then you will have to compare your p-value with a 5% significance level and make a decision as to whether to reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. Why do we give it the term significance level? It is so significant to the extent that it measures the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis. Now, I have to say this kind of thing. Hypothesis testing, it is very easy to prove something true than to prove it false, okay? Let me reframe it again. It is rather very easy to prove something false than to prove it true. I hope you get it now. So once it is easy to prove something false than to prove it true, let me just give this scenario. If as a researcher, I come out to make a bold statement that all dogs in the world have four legs, all dogs have four legs. That is a very bold statement. Now, in order for people to accept that hypothesis that all dogs have four legs, I would rather bring a sample of a number of dogs to prove my point. So what I'm doing is to prove it true. Wonderful. So I bring 100,000 or maybe 1 million sample size, 1 million dogs to prove to my audience that truly all dogs have four legs. And I would say that I am 99% confident that yes, all dogs have four legs. That means there remains a 1% significance level. That 1% significance level can yield a probability of rejecting my null hypothesis. In the sense that if somebody somewhere, due to the fact that there is a birth defect and um, um, uh, that person happens to have a dog that actually has three legs instead of the four, that one dog, which would form the sample size, can sometimes be significant enough to debunk my hypothesis that all dogs are four legs. So that is why we call it 1% significance level. It is so significant that it can lead to the rejection of a null hypothesis. Okay, let's proceed. So at a 90% confidence level, your significance level becomes 10%, 0.10. So if your p-value is less than the 10%, then you would reject the null hypothesis. That is the decision rule. If you are working at a 95% confidence level, then your significance level becomes 5%. And so if your p-value is less than 5%, you reject the null hypothesis. If you are working at a 99% confidence level, your significance level is 1%. If your p-value is less than this 1%, reject the null hypothesis. So if your p-value is less than 5% significance level, then we would say that we are rejecting the null hypothesis and assuming that the null hypothesis states that a population parameter is not significant, then rejecting the null hypothesis, we would draw the conclusion that the population parameter is significant at 5% level. If you are considering a 1% significance level, and formulating a null hypothesis that a population parameter is not significant, then rejecting the null hypothesis where the p-value was found to be less than that 1%, we would draw the conclusion that the parameter is statistically significant at 1% level. Now, statistical tests. Of course, hypothesis testing, then statistical test. So 
how do we inform some of these hypotheses that we formulate? There are basically two categories of statistical tests. We have parametric tests and non-parametric tests. Now, the parametric tests are based on the assumptions from which the sample was taken. So if you have an assumption that your data is normally distributed, as is, as is usual, the case that our data we always want to work with should be nearly normally distributed or normally distributed. That is why we focus on the central limit theory. So we make that assumption that our data should be normal because if your data is normal, any estimation of a mean, okay, in reference or in generalization to the population would seem to be an accurate presentation representation of the population. So we always expect our distribution to be normally distributed. But if it is skewed, then why do we then come up with certain transformations to make it normal? All right. So always that is the focus. So when we make assumptions on the fact that from which the sample was taken, we are within the realms of parametric tests. But when it comes to non-parametric tests, these are not based on any assumption whatsoever. So the data can be collected from a sample, but it does not follow a specific distribution. So we can just go ahead and collect any sort of data we can find and we would want to analyze. If we do not make any assumption on that data that you should follow a normal distribution or follow a certain pattern and all those sort of things, then we can likely reveal the information or the description of the data using a non-parametric test. So eventually, we'll kind of know what, what some of those tests really are. So we have these two statistical tests, parametric tests and non-parametric tests. Now, whenever you are working with data, first and foremost, we would like to explore what we call the assumptions. Once we say exploring assumptions, then which of these two types of statistical tests are we working with? We are working with the parametric tests. So we explore assumptions. So if you see any test that we are conducting that explores assumptions, then we are working with parametric tests. So parametric tests are mostly based on normally distributed data. However, these must be verified. Because if you say your data follows a normal distribution, you must verify that. So the results become inaccurate if parametric tests are conducted on non-parametric data. So later we will see what we mean by non-parametric data. But now, parametric tests, as we said, are mostly based on the normal distribution of data. So with parametric data, we conduct parametric tests. With non-parametric data, we conduct non-parametric tests. So what are some of the assumptions underlying parametric tests? These are the four assumptions so far we normally work with. The first one is that the data is normally distributed. And the second one is that the variance in the data, how spread the scores are from each other should be homogeneous across all these levels. So we say homogeneity or variance. The third assumption is that you must be working with an interval data which means if you are working with categorical variables, that is a different thing. So interval data, for instance, we can have height. The height of a person can be 170. The height of a person can be 171 centimeters. And even between the 170 and 171 centimeters, we can have 170.1, 170.2. That describes an interval data. So typical examples include the weight of a person, the temperature of a place, all these are interval data. And typically, interval data is just simply kind of, if I want to target some common sense, right? Because mostly the data we normally work with, uh, yes, of course, we have that interval data, except that we are working with other categorical variables and we would have ways and means of analyzing it. The last assumption is that there must be independence. Now, if we hear the term independence in regression analysis, anytime you formulate a model, there is what we call the error term. That error term can also be called the unobserved factors. So let's say, for instance, a researcher is interested in looking at how years of education affect the wages of people. So it means that wages become the dependent variable. 
and the years of education become the independent variable. So we are looking at how the years of education affect the wage. Now, there are other factors that can also affect wage, but if we do not capture them in the model, we deposit these variables that have not been captured in that model into the error term or the unobservable factors. Now, those error terms we are saying must have nothing to do with the independent variable. If the error terms have anything to do with the independent variable, we have a certain problem in regression. We call it the endogeneity problem. It means that the error influences your independent variable. Then how correct would your estimation be when you measure that effect on the wages of people? So we establish this notion of independence. Technically, all that we are trying to say is that the behavior of one particular statistic must, must be independent of another statistic. They must not influence each other. So we'll be able to measure the exact influence of one particular statistic and how it can be generalized to the population. So interval data, independence are common sense that, uh, statistical assumptions. But the ones that we can test to verify whether our data follows this parametric kind of test is the fact that the data should be normally distributed and then the homogeneity of variance. So in this session, we are going to focus on normally distributed data and homogeneity of variance. Now, if you want to explore the assumptions, remember we said we are taking into consideration the first two assumptions, normal distribution and then homogeneity of variance. So we are starting with exploring assumptions, normality. If you want to explore this normality assumption, some of the ways you can use to determine whether your data is normally distributed or not, you can use plots, you can use tests. For plots, of course, the typical um, plot that we can use in looking at the distribution of data is a histogram that we are most familiar with. We can also use a density plot. Now, back then we had some lecture on introduction to data and statistics, and we got to realize that if you want to look at the distribution of data, you can use histogram, density plot, dot plot, uh, frequency polygons, and all those sort of uh, plots. But for this session, we'll focus on histogram and density plot. These are enough to determine the distribution. Even you can use the box plot. So we would make use of the ggplot function from the ggplot2 package. Now, when it comes to the test for normality, hmm, if you want to test whether a distribution is normal or not, we use the Shapiro Welk test. So now we would know that if you hear of Shapiro Welk test, then we are talking about a parametric test because we are making assumption about normality. So that eventually, when we get to non parametric tests and then we are mentioning these Komogorov Smenov, excuse me for this kind of test that I'm mentioning right now. All right, Komogorov Smenov and all those Pascal Wallace tests and those things, then you would know we are within the confines of non parametric tests. So, Shapiro Welk test is a test for normality. And normality is an assumption of parametric test. In R, if you want to um, use the Shapiro Welk test to test for normality, we use the Shapiro dot test function. And you simply pass into it your data, which is the X. X would be the vector of the values that uh, it's going to take. Shapiro dot test. So testing for normality, you would have to formulate the hypothesis. The null hypothesis states that there is non-significant deviation from normality. That is just to tell you that it is what? Normal. The distribution is normal. So the null hypothesis states that the distribution is normal. The alternative hypothesis states that there is a significant deviation from normality. So if there is that very significant deviation from normality, then it means your data is not normal. So that is why we are using the term non-significant deviation from normality, because if I had formulated the null hypothesis that the distribution is normal and the alternative as distribution is not normal, then not normal, then might kind of conflict with the concept of null hypothesis. Because null hypothesis usually takes what? Zero, null, none, not, no effects, no treatment, all those sort of words. So here we made it 
non-significant deviation from normality that we know we are dealing with a non 10 in the null hypothesis then the alternative hypothesis states that there is a significant deviation from normality so we can reinterpret them as the null hypothesis mean the distribution is normal and alternative states that the distribution is not normal so like i said if you want to explore assumptions of normality in your data you can use plots you can use tests for normality which we have discovered would be the shapiro work test and then you can also quantify normality that is by conducting what we call summary statistics and within the summary statistics you can generate some statistical terms which are known as skewness and then ketosis to give you an idea about how uh, your, your data is actually normal or not normal. So we look at how to also interpret some of these concepts. Now, when we are quantifying normality, the technical term that we use is simply skewness. So we are going to use the summary tools package. And the function in this package is called the DESCR function, which actually is short for descriptive statistics. And so one thing that we need to observe is that the values of skewness and ketosis should be zero for normal distribution. So if your data is normally distributed, when you generate a descriptive or summary statistics of your data, the values of skewness and ketosis should be zero. If you have any other value apart from zero, then that should tell you that your data may not be normally distributed and in fact may be skewed. Now we go into R and practice it. So we go into the script and we have all the codes that we've written in our previous uh, lecture. But at this point, we are just going to go ahead and explore assumptions underlying our data. So we are within the realms of parametric tests. And that part of parametric tests we are conducting is simply exploring assumptions. And so we are looking at the very first assumption. So exploring assumption, we are looking at normality of our data. So first and foremost, let me just simply make it. I would use plots and the plots we are going to use would be the histogram and then a density plot. So we we'll write some ggplot code to do that sort of uh, visualization on whether or not our data is normal. And when we finish with that, we'll go ahead and now test for normality using one of our predefined tests that will actually reveal to us, will enter deeper into the data and give us results as to whether our data is actually normally distributed or not. And technically, we have explained that we are going to use the Shapiro Wilk test. So now let's start with the plot. We need to make use of data, yes? And so I would like us to use one of the inbuilt data set, which is known as the empty cars data set. We can use any other data, so you can practice it from your end. So we will use the empty cars data set. So for now, we have not um, given way to install packages or use any other package. We are using the base package. So if I call forth the empty cars data set, then I can take a look at my data and then we notice that we have all these variables in there. We've encountered this sort of data before. So um, I'm pretty sure we are familiar with all these variables here. And if you want to even know what these variables mean, of course, you will have to seek help on the data set. All you have to write is a help function and then pass into the help function, the empty cast data set. And you have a description um, in the documentation in R giving you information about what this MPG would literally mean but it means the miles per US gallon and the CYL is the number of cylinders. So you can see clearly that the MPG variable is an interval data, of course. So if you want to hold on to any particular um, test, we are within the realms of parametric tests because one of the assumptions is that it must be an interval data. So data like the variable for VS, before you think about using the parametric test, you must actually consider the assumption, right? So maybe if you want to analyze this one, hmm, even if you're going to use parametric test, there must be something that should inform your choice. So for now, let's work within interval data. 
per the assumptions. So we have the MPG variable. Now, you know that if you want to access um, variables from data frames and all of that, you can say empty cast data frame followed by the dollar symbol, and then you can access the columns in the data frame. Maybe at a point in time, I think we would be using the tidyverse because when we come to plots, of course, we would need to now plot histograms and density plots to show us the distribution of our data. So why don't we call in the tidyverse package? And then I estimate approximately 100% that everybody um, that is part of this class actually has the tidyverse installed. So we just go ahead and load it in memory. So once we have loaded the tidyverse, we can now go ahead and let me say here, let me just pass some notes so that when the script is sent to you, you would be able to follow. So let's say here we call in the inbuilt, or let me just simply call it built in data set, built in data set called mtcast. And then we look at some of these uh, variables. We are going to start with MPG. So we want to find out whether this MPG variable is normally distributed or not. So the first thing I want to do with the visualization is to create a histogram of the MPG variable. So I would say GG plot. Then the first argument is data equals our data frame, so empty cast. Then we pass our aesthetics where the X is simply equal to the MPG variable. And then we can go ahead and create a geom histogram to create our histogram plot. So let me zoom in right there. So this is the distribution of the MPG variable. Now, at this point, we would find it really difficult in determining whether this is actually a normal distribution or maybe a right skew distribution or anything else. Because when we see normal distribution, when we were looking at the distributions in our previous lecture, normal distribution has a certain way of um, the, 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 the certain um, way of look that our data should have. So once we have created a histogram, why don't we try and also create a density plot of that same sort of data? So let me copy this code. And then I would go ahead and change the geom histogram to geom density. So if I run that, hmm, then this would fairly give us an idea that it is somehow right skewed, right? Because we have a very long right tail. And so this could be right skewed. Yet, of course, we will need to find ways of exploring the normality. And it's not just visualization, but we would be using tests as well. So the test can reveal to us whether truly the MPG variable is normally distributed or not. What about if I want to find ways of putting together the histogram and the density plot at, on, on the same graph at the same time? Then the first thing you have to do is to initiate your ggplot function. You're passing your data, which is the empty cast. Then you know inside the ggplot function, of course, we can specify the aesthetic, right? So I'll go ahead and say the aesthetic x equals mpg. Now remember that even in code, you can actually write this same code. For instance, take away the aesthetic function from the ggplot function. And then maybe you can go ahead and add your geom histogram. And within the histogram, the geometry, you can still go ahead and specify your aesthetic x equals mpg. So these two codes do the same thing. But as far as we are concerned, let's just simply specify the aesthetics inside of the ggplot function. So I'll go ahead and add the geom histogram, which we know gives us our histogram plot. But if I want to overlay the density plot, maybe, maybe, let me just simply add the geom density and see if the plot will be imposed on the histogram. 
if I run that, hmm, we really do not see anything, right? But just look at something. There is a very thick line somewhere at the base of the beans of, of the data, okay, the bars. But it doesn't really give us that kind of density plot that we need. So R is forcing to impose this density plot, but I think the scaling is what is causing the problem. So in order for the density plot to come out really well, we would have to go back into the aesthetic function and then specify a Y aesthetic. And we will set the Y aesthetic to a dot dot density dot dot. So that we're just trying to tell R that on the Y axis, we want our density plot. But you see the density is not a variable in the empty cast data frame. So it has to find ways and means of going within the deeper language of R and invoke a density by transforming this variable in there and impose it on the Y axis with our X axis still mapped to the MPG variable. So once I do that and I run that code, let's see what we are going to get. If I run that, wow. Now you can see that we have our density plot overlaid on the histogram. So what I want to do right now is just to add some touches. Maybe I will just come into the geom histogram and I will specify a color to be equal to black. And then if I should run that alone, we will have the border lines of our bars actually having that black line. Then maybe our geom density, why don't we go ahead and give it a color of blue? So we can clearly distinguish between the histogram bars and that of the curve for the density plot. And maybe why don't we increase the size of the density to twice a size? If it is too huge, we reduce its value. Hmm. That is really big, right? So maybe why don't we make it 1.5 its size? Okay, maybe too big, 1.2. I think that is just okay. So that is how we overlay our histogram, um, overlay our density plot on the histogram. Now that we have used the geom histogram and the geom density to overlay, overlay um, sorry, the density plot on the histogram, sometimes there is a function in R. And when we're looking at foundations of probability with R, one of our previous lectures, we learned about the binomial distribution. So we had the R binomial for generating random binomial distribution, right? We had the D binomial. The D actually stands for the density of the binomial distribution. So this is why sometimes when you are moving into statistical in France, probability becomes an essential topic in there. So when distributions are mentioned, you know where they are coming from. So just as we had the R by norm, we had the D by norm. And then when we wanted to calculate the cumulative probability density of the binomial distribution, we used the P by norm. So for all the distributions, there is an R, there is a D, there is a P. And there is one that is called the kill binome, but we'll just, let's stick to this three. So there's an R, there is a D, there is a P. The R will generate the random distribution of whatever distribution that you are creating. So if it is R binome, meaning a binomial distribution, random binomial distribution, if it is R norm, which means random normal distribution, which we have used in our previous lecture, if it is R beta, then random beta distribution. R exp, then we have random exponential distribution. So the moment I change the R to a D, so I can have a D norm. D norm represents the density of the normal distribution. If I use the P norm, P norm represents the cumulative density of the normal distribution. 
So we can use the density, which is the D norm, all right, to overlay a smooth density curve that is very much more representative than the default dium density that R gives us. So of course, the density plot we have here is truly correct and very representative of the, of the, of the data that we are working with. But right now, we would want to use the density distribution, the D norm, all right? So what we are going to do is because we are looking at normal distribution, we use the D norm, not D by norm, all right? Uh -huh. So normal D norm. So what we'll do is we will create our GG plots with our data equals the empty cars. And of course, the aesthetic, we are going to map the MPG variable to X. And then the Y, we just simply make it the dot dot density dot dot. Then we just go ahead and add our histogram like that. When that happens, we only have the histogram, but we are here to include the density care. So instead of using the geom density, we are just going to use the D norm. But in order to have it as part of the GD plot code, there is a function that is called the stat function, where the stat function is part of the statistic layer of ggplot. Where the stat function also takes in the same sort of arguments that any other function could use, like the geom function right here, the stat function also takes in the same sort of argument. So with the stat function, we are interested in this argument called fun. Fun is short for the function to use. And then we'll make use of another argument called the ads, which is short for argument. It says it is a list of additional argument passed onto the function defined by the fun. So if you specify a fun, you should specify any additional arguments that the, the function can take. So for instance, if I take a look at the D norm function, the D norm takes in X, which would be the data itself, actually calls it the vector of quantiles, but let me just call it the data that we need. Now it takes in three more arguments, two of which are very important, the mean and that of the standard deviation which actually can give us an idea about our normal distribution, right? Zero for mean, one for standard deviation means the standard normal distribution. So we want to calculate the density of the standard normal distribu uh, distribution. Then we have a D norm of our data, the mean of zero and the standard deviation of one. So these are the arguments and we are just simply going to pass the mean and the standard deviation into the ads argument of the stack function as part of the uh, ggplot. So we're just going to say start function fun, which represents the fun, okay, which is the function to use, we'll just simply set it equal to d norm. And then we'll just go ahead and specify the ads argument, which is going to take a list. So ads equals list, and then inside the parenthesis, we'll just go ahead and give the additional argument that can be passed onto the function defined by the fun argument. So let me break this one down a little bit, and I'm just going to say the mean should be equal to something, and then the standard deviation should be equal to something. So how do we get the mean of the MPG variable? And how do we get the standard deviation of the MPG variable? What we have to do is we go into the data itself, which is the empty cast. Now, remember, if I do not go into the data and I say the mean of MPG, and then the mean, sorry, the standard deviation of MPG. Now, what you can do is you can actually grab the mean of MPG and then paste it right here and calculate. But we are going to get ND. Why is that so? maybe it is calculating something else because I know there is a built-in data set that is known as MPG itself. So it's kind of trying to go in there, but it has missing values. 
So it is giving us an NA. But if we want to look at the MPG from the empty cast, then we would have to bring the name of the data frame before it and then separate it by the dollar sign. If I run that, I get a mean of 20.09062. So I can copy this mean and then simply paste it here. So the mean equals 20.09062. But maybe we just want how to calculate it right with the code in there and then replace the value behind the scenes for us. So I'm just going to say the mean of MT cast dollar MPJ and the standard deviation of MT cast dollar MPJ. So when I do that, let's now run it and see. So we are going to have our data equals the MT cast. We have our MPG variable mapped to the X axis. We have our Y equals the dot dot density dot dot. I mean, that's just, just to tell GD plot that we want to overlay a density plot. We use our geom histogram to have the bars. And then the start function, we are just, in order to impose the density plot, we are using the function called dnorm, which calculates the density of the normal distribution on that data, where the mean is equal to the mean of the MPG and the standard deviation equals the standard deviation of the MPG variable. So when we run that, let's see how smooth our curve might be. Okay, it says there is an error in list, all right? I think, yes, I know where the error is coming from. And if we should just go to this one, you would see that we have the mean equals the mean of MPG, the standard deviation equals the standard deviation of MPG, but there is a comma after it. So it says that argument three is empty. So it, kind, it is thinking that maybe you want to pass the last argument called log equals false, but you don't need to pass that. So let me just get rid of the comma after the SD to show the end of my arguments I want to use in, 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 the, in, the, in the code. So when I run it now, let's see what result we are going to get. Huh. Another error. So it says that aesthetics must be valid computed stats. Problematic aesthetics, why? Hmm. So this is what is causing the problem, right? Did you map your stats in the wrong layer? I think so. So you know something? Why don't we just grab the Y aesthetic, cut it, and then come into the histogram itself and then paste it into an aesthetic function to stay, like to, to have its own aesthetic in the AES function. Let's see what we're going to get. Sometimes these are some of the things that we normally encounter. And it takes very keen practice to observe some of these things. So if I run that now, oh, that really works. So if I now zoom into the plot, then at least for this normal density distribution, it gives us an idea about where our data is most piled up. And then there is a very long right tail, not too long, but still long. So it could give us an idea that this is skewed, right? So our MPG variable is skewed. All right, so this is just visualization to inspect the normal distribution. Now the next thing, what do we do? After we've checked on the plot, such as histogram and density, then we can go ahead for the test of normality. Actually, I want the test of normality to be last. So the second one, if you recall, let me just add this comment, I, I should be quantifying normality. So let us quantify normality. So all we have to do is to produce what we call summary statistics, where we can have um, we can have skewness in there. And if you just simply use the summary function, okay, and say empty cast dollar MPJ, and if you run that, it only gives you the minimum the first quartile, the median, the mean, the third quartile, and the maximum values. But there's no skewness in there. So the summary function doesn't produce what we need to quantify normality of the data. So I would say not enough. So let us bring into the scene install.packages and in double quote, we simply say summary tools and then the library of summary tools. 
Now, I already have this package installed, so I will just go ahead and load it. If you don't have it installed, just go ahead and install this package. So let me comment this line. Now, once I have loaded this package in memory, there is a function. And if you want to know what functions are housed in a package, you can write the name of the package in total, which is summary tools, followed by double colon sign. And that will give you all the functions that are contained in the summary tools package, a list of them. So I can use the down arrow key to now go through those functions. So we have the very first one where the right hand side gives you a description of the function. It says that the clear TMP will delete temporary HTML files. Now we are not working with HTML, so we don't need this function. We have a C table and that's, that, that's what, let's see. If I scroll down a little bit, all these are the arguments that you can take, but if I scroll down, hold on, it's gone. So let me add it again. Let's come here, scroll down a little bit. Oops, if I want to scroll down, it's not allowing me to do so. All right, but the C table um, is used for cross tabulation. So the summary tools package is a very powerful package which can give you powerful discrete statistics. So you can form, perform cross tabulations and many more. Now this is the function that we need, the DESER, which is used for univariate statistics for numerical data. So I would go ahead and say DESER, then into parenthesis, MTCAS, dollar, MPJ, and run that. And lo and behold, we have our MPG variable well described. So this function in the summary tools package would give you the mean, the standard deviation, the minimum, first quartile, median, third quartile, the maximum values. These are what the summary function gives us. Then it gives you much more, the mean absolute deviation, the interquartile range, the coefficient of variation, the skewness, this is what we need. Then even the standard error of the skewness, and then we have ketosis. And remember from the slides, we said the values of skewness and ketosis should be zero for normal distribution. So if we are getting a positive value of skewness, it means that our data is right skewed. If the skewness value is negative, it means that our data is left skewed. If it is zero, it is normally distributed. Now, the ketosis just gives you an idea about the nature of the density curve, all right? If the ketosis is positive, if it is the ketosis is zero and the skewness is zero, it tells you that that's a normally distributed data. If the ketosis itself is positive, now it tells you that the peak of the density curve, all right, is, is, is pointy and tall. That is, that is the idea I can give you. It is pointy and it is tall, all right? It is heavy, pointy, and tall. Let me use these descriptions for you. And I believe you understand that. If the ketosis value is negative, then it is fairly flat, all right? And then it has very light tail. So at least let's look at the, 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 the peak of the density curve. So if you look at this density curve, you notice that it is not so pointy. It is fairly flat, and that is why ketosis is negative. But if this one had pulled itself a little bit to the top and then have a pointy curve, then that ketosis would be positive. So if your skewness is positive value, it means it is right skew. If it is negative, it is left skewed. If your ketosis is positive, it, is, it, it has a pointy and tall peak of the distribution. But if it's negative, it has a fairly flat peak distribution. And one thing that we must observe is that when it comes to the skewness and ketosis, we said those values should be zero for normal distribution. At least if the values are just so very close to zero, 
then it is nearly normal. If it's nearly normal, then maybe our normality assumption is satisfied. We can use our parametric test to describe anything. But if it is not near to zero, then we have a higher probability of knowing that that data is skewed. So what would be the accept, accepted range? Now, there is no amount of skewness value or ketosis that would truly give you a reflection of what your data looks like. So those are what we call preliminary checkups to just try to determine whether our data could be normally distributed or not. So at least a value of 0.61 for the skewness, if even rounded off to the nearest whole number is one. So at least it should just tell us that, yes, we have a greater likelihood that our data is right skew. But in order to draw the absolute conclusion of the nature of your data, then we move on to the third way of exploring assumption of normality, which is the test for normality. That will truly reveal the nature of your data. So if I go ahead and test for normality, all I have to do is say shapiro.test, which is part of the start base package. And so I will just simply pass into it empty cast dollar sign mpg and run that and then we have a p-value of 0 0.1229 now recall the hypothesis for normality is such that the null hypothesis states that there is non-significant deviation from normality which tells you that your data is normal the alternative hypothesis states that there is a significant deviation from normality. So your data is not normal. If your p-value is less than a particular significance level, you reject the null hypothesis. So let's work with a 95% confidence level that gives us a 5% significance level. So let us compare this p-value to the 5% significance level because 95% confidence level is the most usually um, um, benchmark for determining rejection or non-rejection of hypothesis. So 5% significance level converted to decimals would be 0 0.05. Now, is this p-value less than 0 0.05? No, it is greater than 0 0.05. Hence, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. And if we should fail to reject the null hypothesis, then we can draw the conclusion that our MPG variable from the empty CAS data set is a normal distribution. It's normally distributed. So although the descriptive statistics and that of the visualization may reveal some tendencies of skewness. Now, no, well, I wouldn't say no, but most data are not perfectly normally distributed. That is the situation of what this test actually revealed. From the graphs, we could see that there is that long tail a little bit, right? So at least, and even the value of skewness from the discrete statistics revealed that there was a positive skew. But the positive skew is not so significant a deviation from normality. That is why we use the hypothesis test as the now stating that there is non-significant deviation from normality. So although it may deviate from normality, if it is really not a significant deviation, then of course your data can be accepted and assumed to be normally distributed. You can go ahead and use your parametric test to describe them. Right. So we are just exploring the assumption of normality. So at least we have an idea about um, what normality would look like. So if you are working with any sort of data, you just want to check that your, um, your, your data you are working with is normal or not, then the Shapiro test is there. But always, sometimes, let me say sometimes, do not really rely on tests. 
you must perform other things that we call exploratory data analysis. That is why data analysis has that kind of um, um, a theme there. So whenever you want to make a decision, okay, on, on a particular uh, descriptive statistic, you just have to explore so many options before you can settle on which one you feel at least gives you a fair idea of what your data should look like. So the Shapiro test is, I, would, I wouldn't say is more than enough. At least you explore your, your graphs of the distribution and discrete statistics, and then conduct your test. All these three will put together and you as a researcher would now have to decide whether you would accept the fact that your data is normally distributed or not. You can go ahead with any other statistical inference you want to do. So as far as we are concerned today, we are looking at the assumption of normality. And I've shown you three steps. So when you're working with your own real world data, you know how to go about that. Now, let's go back to the slides. The second assumption, homogeneity of variance. So let's say you are considering two variables. Homogeneity of variance means that the variance of one variable should be stable or equal at all levels of the other variable. In regression, we call it homoscedasticity. So let's look at a typical um, um, graph that depicts homogeneous variance, homogeneity of variance, like I said in regression, homoscedasticity. So this is a typical example. We have two variables, one on the y-axis and the other on the x-axis. And so if we look at the variation of the y-axis for all levels of the x-axis, look at how the points are kind of uniform, okay? The variation looks fairly the same for all levels of the uh, of the variables. And so this is what we mean by homogeneous variance. But if you look at this second graph, you would notice that considering values of y, that is the values on the y-axis, whatever that variable is, the values of the x variable from zero to 20 kind of have this point clustered around the middle line. That line in the middle, let's call it the line of best fit. In regression, we'll explore more uh, of that in detail. So we call that middle line that passes through the middle of the points, the line of best fit. So you can see that from zero to 20 on the x-axis, even to 40 on the x-axis, the, the data looks somehow clustered around that line of best fit with some kind of equal variation, okay, up and down of the line. But if you move from 40 to 60, 70 thereabout, you can see that your points are significantly deviating from the line. So the variation observed at that point will not be the same as the variation observed when the values of X was simply zero to 20. And so when you move up the line of best fit, you see that the points are varying from each other. So we have a situation of non-homogeneous variance. In regression, we would have called this the problem of heteroscedasticity. So there is another graph to also illustrate that same sort of point. So we have the double-edged arrows placed inside the point to give you how the variation of the points are not the same across all levels of the variables. So this is also depicting a situation of non-homogeneity of variance. You would have to forgive me, the heading for this particular slide is confidence level and significance level. I think I forgot to change it to um, that of the homogeneity of various assumption. Sometimes, you know, uh, when we do some of these things, they, 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 do, they normally come in a lot, but at least we understand the intuition, so we're okay. So like I said, this graph shows the non-homogeneous variance. Now we would need to test for the homogeneity of variance. If you want to actually conduct a test of homogeneity of variance, then what sort of test is appropriate for that? It is the Levine's test. So 
So we use the Levine's test to test for homogeneity of variance. Now, if we were dealing with regression, okay, which of course we'll get there, if we were dealing with regression analysis, then once we notice non-homogeneity of variance, which we call heteroscedasticity, then if you wanted to test whether truly your residuals at that point in time is heteroscedastic, of course, we have various tests of that. We have the white test, we have the pack test, we have the glacier test, we have the goldfeld quant test. There are so many tests we're going to consider when we get to regression analysis. We have a lot to cover. But if you are working with your data, okay, at, at least at the basic level, when you notice, well, not noticing, but if you suspect that the variation of the points are not going to be equal, then you can test for homogeneity of variance because we're exploring all those assumptions that make up parametric tests. So we use the Levine's test. Now, the Levine's test is not available in the base package. So we would have to, we would have to install a package called CAR, C-A-R. And that is where we can get the Levine test function in order to test for homogeneity of variance. So we will also formulate the hypothesis that the null hypothesis states that there is equal variance. That means the difference between the variance equal to zero, because I told you the null hypothesis lives up to its name. So it is equal to zero, meaning equal variance. The difference between the variance is just zero. But if the difference between the variance for all levels are not equal to zero, then we have unequal variance. You can reinterpret the equal variance to mean homogeneous, sorry, homogeneous variance, and then the unequal variance to mean non-homogeneous variance. So let's go into R and practice. So now we are just going to look at the tests of homogeneity of variance. And in that case, we are just simply going to use the Levine's test. But in order to conduct this Levine test, we would have to install a package that is known as CAR. So install of packages, and then you pass in double quotes, CAR. And then you can use the library function to call in the CAR package. So I have it installed, so let me comment this line. If you get a script and you don't have it installed, and if you are not installing it now, you can uncomment and run the code. When you finish, just simply run library of car. And when that is done, you would say Levine, L-E-V-E-N. And then at least we have the options that match these characters. And I would like to choose the second one, Levine test. And then I will just simply go ahead and pass my empty cars dollar sign mpj and maybe run this and see what result we're going to get it says what hmm argument group is missing then what's happening why don't we seek help from r on the living test it says that it computes living's test for homogeneity of variance across groups so Y would be the response variable for the default method. Or it can use an LM, which is a linear model, and you want to find out whether uh, we have homogeneity of variance. But there is also a second argument called the group. That is a factor defining groups. So you'd say Y, and then you give it a group. Then there is another argument called center. What is it? The center means the name of a function to compute the center of each group. Mean gives the original living test. The default median provides a more robust test. And if you recall introduction to data and statistics, we mentioned that when data is actually skewed, in fact, the median is a robust statistic than the mean. Because if the, if the data is skewed, the mean will be pulled towards the skew. So median is robust, whether for normal distribution or the skew distribution. But for normal distribution, because the mean and the median are approximately equal, you can just go ahead and use the mean for your interpretation. So here, it confirms it that the median 
provides a more robust test. However, the mean would give the center of each group. So all we need is a y variable. So we would say y equals this variable. And then we would need a group variable. Now, the group variable, you see, when I go back to the slides, let me just simply show you. In order to examine the variation between the points on a graph, you would need a variable on the y-axis, another variable on the x-axis. So that based on the values of the variable on the y-axis, you would be able to determine the variation across all levels of the other variable. And that is exactly what we mentioned right from the very beginning, right? The homogeneity of variance means that the variance of one variable should be stable or equal at all levels of the other variable. So all we need to do is to give a second variable upon which we can test for homogeneity or variance. And so let us simply go into R and give it a second variable. But then which variable do we have to use? Of course, let's go to the empty cast data set and maybe let us look at MPG and the number of cylinders, all right? So we are looking at the distribution of um, miles per gallon on how many cylinders that a car would have. And so I would just simply say that is also equal to empty cast and then CYL. And if I should run that, lo and behold, we have Levin's test for homogeneity or variance, and it uses the default center argument as median. And so it gives us the p-value, which is 0 0.00939. And of course, this value is less than 0 0.05 significance level. Hence, we reject the null hypothesis and conclude that for MPJ and CYL, our variance is unequal. There is non-homogeneity. So you can use just any other um, variable. So MP, MT cas dollar and maybe displacement, all right? And if I should run that, we also get 0 0.1546. So between MPG miles per gallon and the displacement of a car, there is homogeneity of variance because the p-value is 0 0.15, which is greater than 0 0.05. So we fail to reject the null hypothesis. So if you're observing the relationship between two variables, then you can actually test for homogeneity uh, because homogeneity actually creates very good results with linear models. If there is non-homogeneity of variance for linear models, you have the problem of what we call heterogeneity of variance or in the regression term, heteroscedasticity, and they have effects for models when such problems occur. So you can use the Levin's test to test for the homogeneity of variance. Now, you'll notice that when we run the code, we have what we call a warning message. Now, warnings in R are not errors. So it's just trying to tell you that the grouping variable was coerced to a factor. Of course, we have a data type in R known as the factor data type, and that is how R treats categorical variables. So when I gave the second variable a CYL, it transforms this one to a factor data type and then compares within the groups how the variation of the variance would be. If it is equal, then the p-value will be greater than 0 0.05. If it is not equal, the p-value, if it is not equal, the p-value will, will be less than, sorry, sometimes some of these things um, are actually confusing a lot, okay? But the null hypothesis says that um, there is equal variance, okay? So the variance would be equal for the null hypothesis. So if the p-value is, is greater than 0 0.05, we fail to reject the null and state that there is equal variance, so homogeneity of variance, and that is a very good thing for our data, right? But then if the p-value is less than 0 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis and conclude that there is unequal variance. So there will be non-homogeneity of variance, and that is the power of Levin test. Right, correcting problems in data. 
and one more thing like i'm in my console i am facing plus signs you know it's not this so my code is not running so what should i do to eradicate that problem all right so these are some of the problems that we normally encounter in data we have outliers non normality and non homogeneous variance and then missing values so when it comes to correcting problems in data especially in the case of outliers in order to reduce the impact of outliers first you can remove the outlier if you realize that your outlier is even so much more in, like if it is important in your data such as if you remove the outlier and you feel that you are losing so much data you can maintain it maybe seek another alternative and that other alternative is to transform the data well sometimes too you can change the score that particular outlier and of course that is cheating but if this score is very unrepresentative or biases your model then yes change it and usually the method we use is the next highest score in the data plus one. So let's assume that we have data that happens to be within the range of one and five. And then there is one single value that is 10. 10 becomes the outlier because all our data values are within the range of one and five. So all we have to do is to remove that value 10. That is the first case, remove the case. If we feel that removing the 10 value from the data makes us lose data and so we want to maintain it maybe let's transform it now the transformation comes in certain forms we are going to look at that in i think the next side slide but let's look at the third one you change the score so the value 10 which happens to be the outlier you can use the next highest score and the next highest score is the five so you can just simply remove the 10 all right and then just simply say five plus one, six, and put in the value of six when you have removed the value of 10. Or maybe you could maintain the 10. You just add one to the next highest value. So you have a six, which draws it closer to the outlier. And maybe you might have reduced the impact of the outliers. So these are some of the ways you can reduce the outliers, the impact of outliers in, in, in your data. The general rule of thumb is that if how this one is just like identifying outliers in your data. So the general rule of thumb is if you have a value that is the first quartile, the Q1 is called the first quartile. If it is first quartile minus 1.5 the interquartile range, then anything that is below that is an outlier. If you also take the third quartile plus 1.5 times the interquartile range, any value that is above that value is also an outlier. So this general rule of thumb gives you a specific range of values using the quartiles and the interquartile range. And any value that lies outside of this range is simply known as an outlier. So you can go ahead and use any of the uh, ways of reducing the impact of outliers. But in R, there is a function that is called diagnose outlier, which is from the DLOCAL package, D-L-O-O-K-R package. So we use the diagnose outlier and then pass in our data, and then we'll simply have information about whether there are outliers in the data or not. So if you want to impute, just like when you have missing values, you would want to use another value or values that make sense. You want to use it to replace the missing value, but that value must make sense. We normally call it imputation. So if you want to impute outliers, such as right now, I really do not know what method R uses behind the scene when the imputate outlier function is run. But somehow the DLOCAL package gives us this imputate outlier function, which actually does whatever it has to do to correct that outlier problem, or perhaps reduce the impact of that outlier problem on our data. So remember that when we're talking about reducing the impact of outliers, the second step was to transform the data. These are the various transformations that you can also adopt. We have a log transformation. 
So when you have data and then you take the log of that data, it corrects for positive skew on equal variance. Remember, when we go back to correcting problems in data, we actually have outliers, non-normality and non-homogeneous variance. These are problems, then the missing values. So when it comes to outliers, of course, we're going to use diagnose outlier function to diagnose it. And afterwards, if there are outliers, we use the imputate outliers to rectify that kind of problem. But if there are other things such as uh, skill distributions or equal variance and all those sort of things, a log transformation would correct for positive skew and unequal variance. So if you have non-homogeneity of variance, you can log transform the data. And that means it will compress the data values into smaller values so that they can be clustered around to form that uniform equal variance across all levels of the other variables. Of course, you can also use the same square root transformation. The square root of a value would just simply bring the value down because square root of four is two. So we also compress the data as well. So you can use the log transformation or you can take the square root. But one thing you must observe is that if your data have negative values in there, the square root of a negative value is simply undefined. So it means that you have to add a common value to render all negative values to be um, um, zero or it may be greater than that. Like for instance, if you have a range of values that actually is within the range of negative one and five, if you take the square root to transform it, the negative values will pose problems because it is not defined. So all you have to do is you have to add the value of one to all the data values so that the negative one becomes zero. Square root of zero, well, I don't know. If um, the square root of zero two is a problem, then why, why don't we go ahead and add the value of two? But the rule of thumb, you can add any number, but the rule of thumb is that usually try to look at where the value of one added to that would remedy some of these transformations, right? But anyway, if it is negative one to five, and you want to take a square root transformation, the negative will pose a problem. So you can add the value of two to each data value there so that the negative one would become one and a value two would become four and a value five would become seven. You take the square root to transform it. You can go ahead and use that data for whatever analysis you want to make. But knowing that you've added a certain common constant in there. You can also take a reciprocal transformation. That is, you just simply take the inverse of that particular score. So one divided by the, the value. And that also correct for positive skew on equal variance. And then you can do a reverse score transformation, right? That also corrects for negative skew. Hmm, what does it mean reverse score transformation? If you have values like maybe from one to 10, maybe why don't you just simply reverse it maybe 10 to one, can it correct it? If it does, then fine. But at least for negative skew, um, you can, okay. This is how you can actually do it. If it is somehow negative skewed, okay, which means the tail is to the left and you reverse the score, it becomes positive skew. Once positive skew, you can use any of the first three transformations to correct for it. Yes, okay, you can do that. So these are some of the ways of transforming data, all right? So when we are taking the log of a negative value to that is also a problem. It is undefined, it's infinity. So you have to add maybe a common value to all of them. So use some of these transformations with very great um, cautiousness. Well, let's practice. So technically we are just going to look at the outlier situation. So the topic is let us correct some problems encountered in data. And then we're going to look at outliers. So we are just simply going to use our MPG um, variable again from the MTCAS data set. So all I have to do is to install the package called DLOOKR. I have it installed, so let me comment it here for you. And then I will use the library function. I will just simply say dlookr and run that. Well, usually in my case, I normally encounter this kind of um, situation where loading the dlookr uh, package takes some time. But I know 
by now it has already run i don't know if you're going to explain the same sort of situation but you see that there is a stop button in the console the top right of the console you can click on that to interrupt it but i know that if i interrupt it for that long period of time the d local packet is already loaded So once that is done, all I have to do is to say, diagnose outlier. And I just pass in my data. So the MPG, you can pass it to a whole data frame. And then just simply run that. And it says, error in use method, no applicable method for diagnose outlier apply to an object of class double and numeric. Hmm. So let us seek help from our diagnose outlier. And then it produces outlier information for diagnosing the quality of the numerical data. So the diagnose outlier takes in the first argument, which is the data. And the data must be a data frame or a table data frame. OK, so it needs data frame. And then the three ellipses says that one or more unquoted expressions separated by comma, you can treat variables, variable names like their positions. So maybe you pass in the data frame, then you pass in maybe three variables or two variables from that same data for which you want to diagnose the outlier then positive value select variables. So any other value that we specify in place of these three dots would simply be the variables that we are going to specify. So maybe we don't have to grab a particular uh, variable. We just have to pass in the data frame first and I would say MPG and run that and see. Oh, so if I run that, it gives me this sort of information. Now let me just drag this one to the right, run it again. So that it gives you the variable, which is MPG, the outliers count, and it gives me the result as zero, which means there are no outliers. The outliers ratio still, of course, if there are no outliers, there will be no outliers ratio. The mean of outliers, of course, would not be a number because there is zero. Now, this would be the mean of the MPG variable um, without, uh, with outlier. Yeah, so this would be with mean. That is the mean of the MPG variable with outlier, and then, the mean of the MPG variable without outlier. But because there are no outliers, it gives you the same mean values. So what about if I go ahead and say MPG CY, in fact, CYL are values four, six, and eight. So three unique values. So let me use displacement and maybe HP. So I'll use DISP and then HP and run that. And yes, so there are no outliers in the MPG variable, no outliers in displacement, but there are outliers in HP. Of course, one of them is an outlier. And so the outliers, the mean of the outliers is 335. And so with an outlier, the mean is going to be 146, but without the outlier, it is going to be 140.6. So this tells you that HP has an outlier. But once you have the diagnosed outlier, it gives you that information and you can clearly do whatever you want to do. Maybe I don't know, but let me just try. Can I plot this one? So if I say plot and then pass in the diagnosed outlier, I don't know whether it is going to create a plot. If it doesn't, then of course we can stick to just the function itself. Oh, that doesn't give us any information actually. So this one will not work. So you can just diagnose the outlier. I know which variables actually have the outlier. So you can also go ahead and say diagnose outlier and just simply pass into it the entire data frame. And then it would give you all the instances of where there are outliers or there are not. So diagnose outlier, empty cast like that. And then we have for the HP variable, one outlier. For the WT weight, it has two outliers. For the quarter mile time, we have one outlier and all those sort of information that we can get right here. So all I have to do is if I want to reduce the impact of these outliers or correct for it, then I would have to use the 
imputate outlier. And so all I have to do is to seek help from R what this imputed outlier really would do. So it takes in a data, it takes in an X variable, a method of imputation, all right? So we'll pass in our data frame, empty cars. Our X var is simply going to be the MPG variable. Of course, there are, there are no outliers in MPG variable. So why don't we use the weight which has two outliers? So I would say WT. And then it takes in what other argument? The method, okay? Method of missing values imputation. The variable name to replace missing values. But we are imputating outliers. So maybe it kind of treats the outlier, maybe it removes it and replaces it with something else. Who knows? But the method can be any method of a missing value imputation. So we can use the mean, the median, the mode, the capping. Exactly. We can also use the capping. Capping is to impute the upper outliers with 95 percentile and impute the lower outliers with 5 percentile. You can change this criterion with the cap and then you can simply give some kind of percentiles argument in there. So we just simply use method equals capping. So it uses a certain range of values to define uh, which other values that lie outside of it um, and then takes out the outlier. So if I go ahead and run that line of code, then let me drag this one to the right and pull this one up. And then we have all the values of the weights. Now, let me show you something. If I print out empty cars and the weight values, there are how many values? 32, right? So if I want to know how many values, I can go ahead and see the length of empty cars, dollar, weight, and then I have 32 values in there. Then what I can do is if I imputate the outlier, let me call forth the previous code like this, and I cap it at 95 percentile for the upper uh, 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 outlier. Then if I run that, it uses other attributes to give information about what um, the outlier imputation actually was done. But over here, we have this number is 23. 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32. So we still have the same 32 observations as in the original data, but the outliers have been imputed, all right? The outliers have been imputed. And so that is how you can impute outliers in your data. Now, let's just finish it and then we call it a day. Let's just finish it. So what we'll do is if you want to impute missing values, it means that we are replacing a missing value with another value that makes sense. And some of the common methods are the mean, the median, the mode. These are the ways we can actually replace missing values uh, in there. But the DLOOKAR package has the impute any to actually impute missing values. And the miss ranger also uh, would have other ways of also imputing missing values for you. And that has been very easy if you are correcting missing values in, in your data. Okay, so the thing is, how would you be able to note the missing values in there? We'll go ahead and use a package and then we simply finish our lesson. And so I would go ahead and say, we are correcting for some problems encountered in data. And when that happens, we are going to correct for missing values. And so with that, we would have to diagnose the issue, right? There is a, a data frame that we want to use. So I would just simply say, we want to use the built-in, the built-in air quality data set, right? And when that happens, we can go ahead and check the number of missing values in the air quality data set. And in order to do that, of course, we will need the DLOOKAR package, but remember, we have already loaded it, okay? So the packages, the needed packages, we have the library of DLOOKAR used up above. 
And then we'll also have to install the Miss Ranger package, which is M I S S R A N G E R. And then you go ahead and load it in memory. So Miss Ranger, right? I have it installed. So I'll comment this one and simply run this code to call this one because I've already called forth the DLocal package. So once I have done that, I am going to use the imputate any, but before that, even in the DLocal package, there is a function. So we have the DLocal double colon. There is a function, is it diagnose? Okay, not diagnose, we have plot. Yes, we have plot NA parito. So here I would say there is a function in the DLocal package called <clears throat> plot NA parito, which would give a visualization of the missing values in the data. Of course, there is also another powerful package for exploring missing data. That package is this dot. And the function is, sorry, let's use that about two functions in there that can do whatever I want to do. The functions are, we use the this miss, and then we can have the this that. I think this data, let me just do this. And I have, yeah, this that right here. So you can visualize your data. So let me just append this note so you can visualize the entire data or here you can even <clears throat> you can even visualize only missing values so now let's use the plot any parameter because we have already called in the dlocal package so all we have to do is say plot any parameter and then you pass in the data frame. So I'm going to say air quality, and let me drag this window to the left and run this code. And let's see a Pareto chart of the missing values in there. So once we do that, for all the variables in the air quality data set, we have ozone, solar radiation, day, month, temperature, and wind. We do have about 24.2% missing values in ozone, and then we have 4.6% missing values in solar radiation. So what would happen is it gives you a legend that describes when the missing values would actually be a very good problem and suggest you what to do about it. If you have somehow greater than 50% missing values, that is really, really bad. It says remove it. But if you have anything that is less than 50%, but greater than 20%, then that is bad. Okay, and that is typically the coloring that is applied here. And then if you also have a missing values of less than 20%, but greater than 10%, well, not bad. So I think for good, okay, not bad, and bad, maybe for good, okay, not bad, you can actually impute them. But for bad, maybe you might consider imputing it or removing it. But if it is actually greater than 50%, just remove the variable from it. That is the information we are getting from the plot NA parameter. Now, if I want to use the this that package, of course, you would have to also install this package called this that. And then I would use the library function and call the this that. And then I can say this that actually representing visualized data, and I'll pass in the air quality data, and let me pass the same air quality data frame. So if I run this alone, then we have a visualization of where we are likely to encounter missing values in there. So you can see that the missing values are the gray colored ones, and then the blue colored ones are the numeric data types, 
and the red or almost orange color is the integer. So it's just trying to tell you the distribution of data types, but with specific emphasis on the NS, the missing values in the data. So you can see that the ozone and the solar radiation have all these missing values. But if you want to view only the missing values in there, then you can run the vis miss, visualize missing data from, from this particular air quality data frame. And that would also give you a hash background, a, an ash background, okay, with a black coloring indicating where the missing values are found. And so we have from the ozone where the missing values are, and then from solar radiation where the missing values are. The rest of them do not have missing values. So these are the ways that we can actually look at missing values. Even in the plot par, uh, plot any Pareto function, we also have an argument called only any. If you set it to true, it will only visualize the any. So for instance, let me plot again the any Pareto, which gives you the entire variables in the data frame and where the missing values are. But if I just simply make it only any equals true, then it would give you only those columns where there are missing values and give you the distribution of the missing values in there. So once you have this, then you would have to now impute the missing values. So we are going to use the imputate outlines. So impute missing values using imputate, dice outlines, imputate any, right? Yes, imputate any function. So when this happens, we just need to kind of look at how imputate any uh, function can be used. And what it does is it's a very powerful function and you're just going to love it, okay? Now what is going to happen is we use the imputate any, we pass in our data frame. So let's do that one after the other. So I would say imputate any, and then I'll put in the data frame. So I'll say air quality data, comma, now the X variable would be the variable name to replace the missing value. So let's say in our data frame, we are going to replace the missing values in ozone. Then I would have to say my X var equals ozone. Now my Y var is going to be the target variable. So assuming in the air quality data set, If I wanted to use a particular variable to, to create a model, maybe a linear model, that variable should be the Y var, the, the one that we are predicting, okay? The one that would be the dependent variable would be the one you use for the Y var. So based on the, the variable you are predicting, you are going to impute the missing values for the X var. That is what it means. So I have not even called in the air quality data set, but it's part of the base package. So it's still working whilst I'm doing this, but let me come up here and say that I am calling it out explicitly. So air quality, and if I should run that, I have my air quality data set. So I can go ahead and click on it in the environment window to view that data frame. So let's say I am predicting temperature. If that is what I'm predicting, then I only have to come into the imputed NA and then give it TEMP as my variable in there. Then when I finish, I will just simply give the method for the imputation. So method is the method of missing values imputation. And if I go down to the details, of course, the method, you can use the mean, the median, the mode, the K nearest neighbors, which actually uses machine learning algorithm, supervised machine learning algorithm, KNN to do that. And you don't need to know machine learning. All you have to do is to say method equals KNN. We have the R part, which is for recursive partitioning and regression trees. That is also supervised machine learning. We also have the MICE, which is the multivariate imputation by chain equations. So all these are the methods that we can use in imputing the missing values. Now, let me show you how powerful this imputate any function can be. So all I have to do is I would go ahead and specify the method to be equal to the mean first. So let me drag this one to the right. 
And then I will copy this. But before I run the second one, if you let me delete the second one, once I have this, all you have to do is to run that code. So we have air quality data set, the X variable, the variable I want to impute the or impute the missing values is ozone. And the variable I'm using to impute the missing values, which is a target variable, is a temperature, and I'm using the method mean. When I run that, I would get where the missing values have been imputed. So in this data set, there are no missing values. So wherever there are Ns, there are missing values, we are going to have the mean replacing that missing value. But in order for you to have a very good picture of that sort of data where the missing values have been imputed, then you know what? I would have to chain the function called autoplot. Is it autoplot or plot? Let's use autoplot. Now, once I do that, so let me see how I can do this. So I have this code, then I will plot how the missing values have been imputed. It compares the original data where there are missing values and the ones that have been imputed and gives you a distribution of them to see whether the mean was actually a good choice in the imputation. So all I'm going to do right now is for this chain operator to work, I would need the tidyverse uh, um, package. And of course, I think um, in the beginning of the lecture, we loaded the tidyverse package. So once it is there, we can go ahead and run this. Now, what I'm going to do is let me come here and break this down. All right, like this, and then I will plot. Because when I do that, so that it doesn't go beyond that, I need a, a wider window for us to view our plots. So once I do this, it becomes very easy for us to see our code head on and then execution. So all I have to do is to place my Keza anywhere on this line, and then I will simply click, sorry, I will simply run this code. So control enter to run that. And it says error in auto plots, objects of type imputation numeric not supported by auto plots. So maybe what about plots? What about plots? If I run that, hmm, so it is rather plot, not auto plot. So plot will now show you. So when I'm using the rest of them, at least you can now interpret this on your own. But for this one, the green line shows the original data, and then the red line shows the imputed values. And I can see that the imputed values using the mean method, it gives you the imputation method as a title. The mean method does not give you a distribution that closely resembles the original data. And imputing missing values means we are replacing missing values with values that make sense. So using the mean, we see this very high peak um, um, density plot, and that looks nowhere close to the original data. So using the mean for imputation may lead to the wrong conclusions. All right. So not just the mean, we have a lot of them. So let's use the various methods and then we'll go ahead and run each one of them and see which one actually makes sense. So I would have the mean, then I would have the median for the method. Then for this method, I would have the mode. If the mode works for this one, if I would have the KNN, for this one, I would have the R part. And for this one, I would have the mice. So these are all the methods of imputation. So I'll try each one of them, one after the other, and see what we're going to do. But it gives you some kind of information. It says that the predictor is a categorical variable, use mode, use R part, and use mice. All right. So the predictor that we are using, which actually happens to be the temperature, OK, is not a categorical variable. So we are free to use, I think, any other methods maybe the mode, the R part and the mice. Let's find out and see. But for specific predictor being a categorical variable, you have to use these three methods of imputation. So we've already run that of the mean. So we'll go ahead with the median. So if I run this, the median also have some kind of a peak that is giving you something that is getting closer to the original distribution, but still there is some kind of a deviation, okay? That high peak above that. So let's use the mode. Okay, the mode two, what it does is to replace missing values with the most frequent occurring value. And uh, that also does not look so much impressive. 
kind of close, but that, that peak over there is deviating a little bit. So let's use the KNN, all right? The machine learning algorithm. Oh, you can see how the KNN also is trying very hard to capture the distribution, all right? So the KNN is making sense, or let's say it has made sense. In fact, between the mode median and the mean and KNN, KNN is a better, is the best method of imputation. What about the R part? Let's find out. Recursive partitioning and regression trees. Oh, almost like the KNN, right? And then the mice. The mice uses some kind of iteration in the background. Okay, so I think the R part and the KNN, because this one, the KNN and the R part, let me just go back a little bit. So we have the KNN. We have the R part, KNN, R part, good. So R part looks better than the KNN. Oh, the mice also has some slight deviation. So I think for the imputation, the R part is the best um, uh, method of imputation for this particular variable. So once you have done that for a zone, then you can also go ahead and impute for solar because there are missing values in the solar radiation. So all you have to do is to grab this same sort of code and replace the X bar with the solar plot and see which one actually makes sense. So once I know that it was the R part that made a, a lot of sense, then I can just simply remove this plot and then go ahead and give, for instance, the air quality like this, dollar sign, and I would say ozone, and then I will save it into that same variable to replace the missing values in there by removing this particular uh, plot. So what I do is I will just do this and run, and then the values would be imputed and then replaced in the original sort of data, All right? But let me maintain this thing. So you can do that for the next column that has the missing uh, value. You can also impute it like that, the same way we did with the ozone. But at this point in time, if you have 30 columns in your data frame, and then you have to impute each one of them separately. Hmm, that looks very tedious, right? So if there are a lot of variables in your data and you want to impute all of them at once, in fact, you notice that even with the imputate NA from the DLOOKAR package, it uses the variable for which you are imputing the missing values and then only a predictor variable, right? But then when you have your data and you want to use all the variables, all the information for all the variables, um, to impute the missing values in that same right data, then you would have to move the beyond the DLOOKAR and we are going to use the miss ranger function and that will close our lesson for today. And so what I'm going to do is the DLOOKAR, in fact, I will add that note when I'm sending the script to you. So at least let's know that when you are dealing with the imputate NA from the DLOOKAR package, it uses the predictor variable as only that variable for which the missing values can be imputed in where there are missing values. But now we are going to use the, so we we'll use the miss ranger function from the miss ranger package. And so all I have to do is to call forth the miss ranger. And I think I have done that up there. Yeah, we've called the miss ranger package. And so all we have to do is to use the function. So miss ranger function. Then let me go ahead and seek help from R on how to use this function. And as fast as we can, we can actually um, implement this whole thing. It says that the ranger package is a fast imputation of missing values by chained random forest. Now, random forest is a supervised machine learning algorithm as well. So you see how the machine learning is really making headway into some of these problems that we encountered um, in data back then. But now machine learners are making breakthroughs and giving us very good um, imputations. And so all we have to do is to pass in the data. So I'll just go ahead and say, Miss Ranger. And then the data is going to be air quality, comma, 
And then the formula, you just grab this whole formula. Don't do anything to the formula. So let me break it down and paste it right there. So all you have to do is say formula equals dot, then the squiggly line or this tilde symbol, then another dot, then the comma. Now, what this means is that the dot on the left-hand side of the, of the tilde symbol is saying that use all the variables in the data as the predictor variables, use all of them. And the dot on the right-hand side of the tilde symbol also says use all the variables and impute whatever missing values that you can find in there, all right? So it takes all the variables as a function of all the variables and use whatever um, uh, learning that the machine can deduce from the missing values across the entire data distribution. we we'll just fill in all the missing values wherever they are, however they are, all right? Using the chained random forest supervised machine learning algorithm. So all I have to do is to specify the data and that of the formula, and I'm done. And then the rest, I think not really necessary. The number of candidate non missing values, the max data, the maximum number of chaining iterations. Well, I will let R set it by default. So 10L, an integer. Then the seed, actually, you see, anytime I run this code, all right, what really happens is it uses machine learning algorithm, which is a random imputation. So it goes through some iterations, all right, and then like it did with the mice method. You can see that it iterated through the entire combinations of ozone and solar or whatever kind of thing that are there and imputed the missing values for you. So machine learning uses uh, uh, this kind of algorithms behind the scenes to do certain things. So when I run this code, now if I manage to impute the missing values, if you run the same code on this same data set, the kind of imputation that you get will not be the same as my values that I get. So all I have to do is to set a seed equal to a certain value. So if I say the seed equals one, two, three, or maybe the seed equals 45. If I set the seed, so comma, I say seed equals 45. Then when I run the Miss Ranger code now to impute my missing values and that is done, the same values, that were used in the imputation, where the missing values are and they were imputed, those values, if you also run the same code with a seed of 45, you'll get the exact same values and the exact same imputed values in, in our data frame. So that is the function of this seed argument in the miss ranger function. If you do not care about reproducibility, that is somebody running your same code and getting the same sort of result, then you can just simply ignore setting the seed. But if I want you to get the same result as I, as I have, then you would have to set, I would set the seed and if I send the code to you, you replicate the same sort of sort of thing, all right? Then we have other things like verbose and all of that. We really don't need anything else. So all we need is what? The seed. The verbose will simply control how much information is printed on the screen. Like over here, you see when it performed the iteration, it printed some kind of thing to let you know that it was iterating through the, the, the thing. But the verbose equals one, or it zero means to print nothing. So all it does is behind the scenes, it goes on through the algorithm using the random forest and then gives you the imputation without printing anything for you to see, but it will finish the code. Then if you also set it equal to one, then it will keep on giving you information uh, to show you the progress of how the imputation is being done until it finishes and then the whole thing. And then it's the two to print the OOB prediction error. What do you mean by OOB? Well, I, I really don't understand that, but um, th that is what it really means, okay? And then maybe one minus R squared, okay, so it will give you the R mi one minus R squared for regression and whatever. So I will just leave it at default, which is just simply the verbose equals one. Now let's close our lesson by running this last code. And then in three, two, one, and boom. Right, so by using whatever iteration that is, now let me drag this one to the right and scroll up, it takes the entire data frame. So just in four iterations, it takes the entire data frame and wherever there are missing values. Now, let me pull this one down a little bit. All right, here. You can see that the fifth observation for ozone and solar were actually missing values, but it has imputed them replacing 
them with the very best values that the machine can learn and find. All right. So once this is done, you can go ahead and save this data frame into another object. So maybe you can call it a data frame DFF. So that if you run that, you now have your DFF. So once you have your DFF, you can say plot NA Pareto, and then I'll put in my DFF, which is the new data frame. And if I should run that, it says data has no missing value. So error in the plot, it doesn't plot anything, right? So here it has no missing value to plot. But then if I use the this miss and I pass into it the DFF, then I'm going to get a plot where it shows you that there are no missing values and of course, every data is present. So if you want to use a very fast imputation, missing value imputation, then I think I would recommend using the miss ranger function from the miss ranger package to do the imputation because it uses all the variables in the model as predictor variables and uses all the variables as um, the response variables and impute all missing values so that your data frame follows a, a, a replacement of missing values with sensible values that is reflective of the entire data frame. So at this point, I would say thank you very much for attending this meeting. This brings us to the end of the um, uh, Satisfy in France with our concepts and applications. We've learned a whole great deal of lessons. So keep on practicing and the quotes are really tiresome but they are worth it. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was very, 